Hello everyone, um, thank you for the invite. I'm Rory. Um, I'm going to talk to you about this uh, uh, program I've been uh, running with for six years-ish. Uh, That's our logo. <coughs> and it's got to do with how we uh, basically reinvented Google's infrastructure to basically avoid need for a, a perimeter, perimeter defense. That's some basic history of, uh, of me. Uh, I've been around for around the block a couple of times. Uh, I've worked in Silicon Valley um, and LA for about 11 years. Um, I worked in Netscape before that. I worked in General Magic, who did the very first PDA type thing. Um, and I've worked in Google for a little under 10 years. Um, and I was educated in Dublin. I, I'm actually based in Dublin, so I flew over this morning. So this is great. Right. Okay. So let me give you some context of what we're trying to do here. So this is really a story of how we sort of reinvented Google's IT infrastructure over about um, six years. A complete reinvention. Really what they call it now is they call it a zero trust um, network. Um, I've been involved pretty much since the concept um, was invented back in around 2011. Um, I'm going to give you an idea of um, why and how and uh, some idea of the scope because we had to basically move the whole company into this program um, without breaking anybody, as you'll discover how we attempt to do that. Okay. So for context, this is a very nice castle in Wales, right? And it is probably the way um, Cap Genomize Enterprise is set up, probably the way pretty much every company's enterprise is set up, and it was the way um, Google's enterprise used to be set up, okay, until somewhat recently. So this is the perimeter model, right? Uh, typical analogy is a castle with a, with a moat. The, uh, the idea is that people on the inside are good, generally speaking good, and the people on the outside are assumed to be bad, and, and there's only one way in and one way out, which is through the drawbridge, right? Usually in vernacular of us, it's a firewall, right? Um, and then once you're on the inside, you tend to have access to all the goodies that are on the inside, okay? So that's the way we were set up, and like I said, most uh, most companies. Um, so there are some issues with that, uh, which sort of converged um, in Google around 2011-ish. Okay, um, some more important others. So the one on the top left is a mobile workforce. So that's sort of unusual to Google, I assume. Nobody else has got a mobile workforce. Right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so so we had obviously lots of people who were wandering around the world, and they wanted to uh, and they wanted to work. So the first issue with a perimeter defense is that, in this case, the people you're trying to protect actually are not actually inside a building anymore. They're wandering around. So in most cases, what companies have done is they have extended the perimeter to an individual outside using a VPN. So they get an, an into the internal network, the corporate internal network, using a VPN. So anyway, that's the first issue. So you sort of stretch the, the analogy to around every individual uh, who is mobile. Okay. Second issue was uh, cloud. So uh, Google starts to, has started to use cloud services, like we use Gmail internally, which is in the cloud. Lots of things in the cloud. Um, so we had another problem with the cloud, which is that the things we were actually trying to protect also were not inside the building. Right? So we had this analogy, which was starting to fall over um, pretty severely. Uh, on the bottom right was uh, multiple types of devices. So we had people using de desktops and laptops and tablets and phones and multiple types of phones and everything else. And we did have some issues with um, usability of uh, VPN. And that was one particular issue we had. And the last one is uh, cyber attacks. So we were, and continue to be, completely concerned about uh, cyber attacks. We uh, have lots and lots and lots of data that we uh, take the protection of very, very seriously. And there was an issue at the time where Google was hacked, just like lots of other people have been hacked. Just like the WannaCry over the past couple of days caused lots of issues. Um, I wish that I'll point out actually that WannaCry could not have happened in Google based on what we've done, which I'll explain to you in a bit. Anyway, so these all came to a head around 2011-ish, right? And um, so we started looking at how we would um, deal with these issues. So initially, we thought about we could build you know, um, uh, bigger walls, fatter walls, multiple layers of walls. Um, and that the, the problem we ended up with that is that we, we didn't really think that we could ever have 
a completely safe, protected, privileged network. Right? So that took quite a while to get to, to be perfectly honest. Like a lot of people didn't believe that, and there was a lot of talking about whether we should any grant either. But eventually we came to this, um, this conclusion. Right? So we actually don't believe that the perimeter defense works anymore. Um, it worked back in the day when you know, uh, intranets were first invented and everybody worked in a particular building and they never left, or at least they never brought their laptop home, worked fine then. But no longer works anymore. Right? So I gave this presentation in February, which is a bit difficult in the US, seeing as uh, um, George Bush actually does believe in walls. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I had to be careful what I said there. Uh, anyway, so we don't believe they work. So, so instead we had to... Uh, Donald Trump has not seen this, but I'm sure if he did, he would leak it to the Russians. I'm sure he'd leak it to the Russians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so I don't think he's seen it. Yeah, so it didn't cause too much issues at the time. Um, so anyway, so, so then you move from the point where if you no longer believe that a perimeter um, defense works or can work, right, what do you move to? Okay, so then we entered this thought exercise for about six months to, um, to a year. And we ended up with something like this. Right? So this is... A different analogy. So the idea is that this is a much more cosmopolitan street, hence the graphic. Right? And um, what you can see here is there's a large bunch of people on the street. You can't tell who's good. You can't tell who's bad. And all the services are on the, are on the side of the street. So really people are intermingled. Right? There's no way to know just by where they are, whether they are good or bad, or whether they should have access to services purely based on where they are. Okay? So that's the model we try to come around with. But obviously you still have to be able to access your corporate services securely, right? So how do you do that? Right? So another six months of lots of thought and discussion. And we ended up with um, a couple of core principles um, which we have been living with basically for the past six years. So the first is this, right? So where you are doesn't give you any privilege. So for the network you're on gives you zero privilege, hence the zero trust uh, moniker which is used every now and then. Right? So whether you're on an internal network, you're on a Wi-Fi in a coffee shop, you're on a plane, you're in a visiting building, really makes no difference whatsoever. Okay? So if that doesn't do it, something else must. Right? And what it does is, is this. So we instead of basing privilege or access based on where you happen to be, instead we base it on knowledge of um, the individual and knowledge of the device that you're, that you're using. So we use a higher level knowledge-based um, access control as compared to a location-based um, access control. Okay. And lastly, um, every single access requires this authentication, so OTC, OTHN, um, and encryption. And so a lot of cases this will be for the very first access to a particular um, service. In the case of us, of what we've done, it's actually for every single access. Like, no matter what you're doing, every single access to every single internal service requires this step uh, also. Okay? So there are three um, core principles. I ended up with this mission, which we invented years ago. Uh, and I've been driving this program for uh, four years, uh, for six years. Um, so that is, so every employee, it's actually every employee or, or a temp or a TVC or every vendor, right? Um, can do all their job from anywhere without a VPN. Okay. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, you have to be able to do it exactly the same from a plane or from here or from the train or whatever right, without a VPN. So that's quite a difficult thing uh, to do. It was quite a difficult thing to sell, to be perfectly honest. Right? A lot of people didn't think this was at all attainable. Um, but this is the model that we started with, and then we've worked for years to try and get to that point. Okay? So that's the why. Okay, now I'm going to describe some of the how, with some ideas of, of how you can do it. Uh, I should say, this is, this is an internal program we've run for years. Um, there is the, the beginnings of, a, of a, cloud, a Google Cloud product, but I'm not allowed to do product pitches here, so I won't. But there is the beginnings of one, which, when, uh, which we can describe how we did that. But this is more how we did it internally. So this Windows laptop is half trusted, right? So they have, we have these policies which describe what these particular things are. Okay. And what this beast of a system which my teams run, it dynamically decides the trust level of every single, every single machine in the company 
all the time. Okay, and these, these tiers, as they're called, can go up or down depending on what's happened. Right? So if we don't see a machine on the network for some while, the tier level drops. If you haven't installed a security patch level, then it's, the, it drops. You can actually attempt to request a higher trust level, depending on what you're asking for. But these, both the, the device inventory is dynamic, the data sources are dynamic, and the policy on front of the security team is dynamic. Okay. So, so at this point, what we have is we have complete knowledge of users, complete knowledge of devices, and a trust bit or a flag for every single device that we use. It's all relatively clear, I hope. Then we build this thing, this access control beast, right? This engine, and what that does is that that describes the access policy. It's a little like a firewall access policy, although it's a little, little more. So what you can say is, um, you can say, uh, let's say you want to access a, a code source tool. So the policy would say you have to be a, uh, a full-time engineering employee, and you have to be coming from a fully trusted something. Desktop. You could even say desktop. You could say fully trusted device or fully trusted desktop. And um, we happen to have a very funny meme generator uh, in work, right? And so that can be accessed from uh, any employee or temp, right? And then come from an untrusted device. We have the lunch menus, same thing, right? If you want to access the the legal apps, you have to be a fully full time member of the legal department coming from, and you could say a fully trusted. X laptop, you can say a Chrome laptop, you can say anything else, right? And those policies, the, the, what we've done is, although you can define it for each specific application, of which there are about 10,000, we, we actually have broken the different classes of applications, and that those policies come from, from each, from, from security team. Again, the policies are uh, dynamic, so you can, they can update it and do update it anytime they want, right? Um, so the access control engine is, so you, you make a request to it, and it says yes or no, depending on what, the user is, what the device is, and what the resource you're trying to access um, is. Okay. okay. Access control engine. And the, the last, uh, but not least part, is we then make it available from everywhere. So, so we have an external single sign-on. Again, not that unusual, um, but we have an external single on, on the, in the in the internet. And the access proxy is actually, it's the exact same tech that's used behind Gmail or Maps or Search or anything else. It's, it's a thing called the Google front end, the GFE. It's a globally deployed, you know, fault tolerant, uh, things like DDoS protection, like it's, it's everywhere, right? Incredibly, incredible piece of tech, actually. Um, and so it, when you try and access a legal app, it hits a GFE, closes one, whatever you are on the globe, and then it delegates it down to the access control engine, who then says yes or no, and then you get access to the particular application itself. So the important part is that the only way to access any of these services, regardless of what the service is, and regardless of where you are, so this is meant to be a Google building, or a coffee shop, or, or a plane, so you access the same technology. So there's no internal version of this. So regardless of whether you're outside or inside, it's the exact same technology. The only thing you might notice is there might be a slight difference in latency, right? But that's the only difference. Right? Um, okay, so that's the way uh, we've done the whole thing. So that, that I think answers all those bits. One more there. That's all those bits there. Okay. So that was the model we decided to implement. So that took us, to be perfectly honest, years uh, to invent. Like uh, when we first uh, conceived of the idea, we actually went looking for organizations who'd done something similar, and we found practically nothing. Right. Um, we eventually found a, a paper uh, that was written by NIST um, about a zero trust um, thing. But that was in like 2013. We were way ahead of this. We did find uh, Netflix had done the beginnings of something um, similar, but I, I got nowhere near this implementation yet. Okay, so so that that was the first part. So we invented all the technology. Okay, so uh, we the execs were all quite supportive of all this. They said, "Yeah, that's all great. Go do that." And by the way, don't break anybody. Okay, so that's that turned out to be sort of a difficult part. So this is a a vast number of people who work in Google. Um, all looking like wildebeest, all going in the same direction. Um, so the, the problem was that we, we had to get people onto this new model, but without breaking any type of business continuity or productivity for the existing uh, teams. Okay. And there is in the order of, well now there's about 80,000-ish people, right? Um, 250 buildings-ish, somewhere in there. Okay. So this is what we did. So. Um, 
so initially we we deployed a, a brand new network. So the network on the left is meant to represent this completely unprivileged network, effectively being on the outside, effectively being here. Right? So we deploy that in every single uh, company. That was quite a significant uh, capex uh, cost, and uh, it took a fairly long time to do, um, because we had to update a huge amount of network kit in the company. So we had that deployed, and we had the old, current, the legacy application, the privileged application, um, also uh, deployed. And of course, everybody, every single device was on the one on the right. So we deployed the one on the left, but nobody on it. So there was me going, I'd like a, you know, X million dollars to you know, deploy all this new kit, and by the way, nobody will use it for a while. Okay, so that was a bit of an interesting conversation. Um, okay, so then what we did is we took this process where we, where we analyzed all our own, we basically sniffed our own traffic, right? So we actually started with two particular, two ways of doing it. Initially, we sniffed all the traffic from the network routers in the company, right? So we got sample traffic from the network routers. Um, and what we did is we, we effectively sort of replayed this traffic on this unprivileged network, right? So we were able to see if that, that traffic initiated on this unprivileged network, whether it would work, right? right? Whether it would get to its destination. Right? And so we were able to do lots of work. So really it ended up that, that lots of applications were not behind this particular access proxy from the previous slide. And right? that was usually what the initial problem was. So the, there's a minimal amount of configuration you have to do to say this is where the application is, this is what the load balancing is, this is where you find it. So lots of applications didn't have that yet. And if they weren't, configured behind the access proxy, they were not available. Right? So by, by replaying the traffic, we were able to see this particular uh, issue. And we found a whole bunch of things which we never thought would even exist, which we then went through a yak shaving process and we resolved these issues one by one. Yeah. The second thing we did is we, we actually built a simulator of this network and we installed it on every single machine in the company. Okay? So it's, it's basically an IP tables rules, but it describes the 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 privileged, the unprivileged network. So what we do then is that for every piece of traffic that comes from every single device, it runs through this particular simulator, and there's two modes for the simulator. One is a logging mode, so if the traffic would not work, we log it, right? and then we analyze it. And then the other one was an enforcement mode, which was if it didn't work on this new network, we would deny the traffic completely. Okay? So initially we left everybody in logging mode, which means nobody broke. Which is important part. But we got to track every single piece of network traffic that would not work. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. And then we had a lot of traffic. We built this migration pipeline. So uh, what it means is that we have all our analyzed traffic, and I mean we have like terabytes, petabytes of traffic. Um, although really all we had was we had the source and the source uh, uh, IP and port, and we had the destination IP and port. That's all we had. So just the net flow. Uh, traffic, right? but we were able to analyze that, and then for every single device, we had all the traffic, and we could say um, which traffic would and wouldn't work. So we could say, for example, in this this case here, if a particular device for 30 days had, you know, 99.99% .99 of its traffic work on this new network, right? We would say you're good to go, and the next time they authenticate the network using uh, Radius and 802.1.x. We would, we would authenticate them to this new unprivileged network. And we wouldn't know it would work, right? Well, a couple of use cases. Like they, if they hadn't used some application for 45 days and it wasn't going to work, then we would incorrectly put them on it. But that wasn't really, it wasn't really a problem. If we analyzed the traffic and we knew that over the past 30 days you didn't pass that criteria and those, those we had levers to move all this, this criteria, we would leave you on the old network and then we would analyze why we left you on the old network. Right? So a particular set of applications would, be, would cause a problem. We would say, okay, that application has to be moved, and then we would go through the whole process um, again. Initially, when people joined um, Google, we would leave them on this network. So you're, you're a brand new Google employee, we would put you on the privileged network, and then we would eventually move you over. I argue that we should put you on the unprivileged, but we were too worried about breaking new users and giving them a bad experience, so we didn't do that. Okay, so, so what we've done here is over, this took about another three years. We don't move that fast. Um, and we've moved the majority of the company, not necessarily the vast majority, but we've used, like, I mean like 70% of devices are now on this particular um, network, right? 
So that means 70% of, of people are on this unprivileged network and there's really, like there's no privilege uh, <coughs> as, uh, compared to them being in this, in this room or on the plane or wherever else. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, um, so we've done some outreach to uh, the community, including me um, coming here. So it was first mentioned in 2013 by the CTO. Um, and then we've written a couple of uh, documents uh, uh, for Usenix for the login um, publication. Um, so there's three here, and that's the first one I wrote on the top right. We're actually just about to publish a, a fourth one. So this, the, this one here uh, describes the concept. Um, the middle one uh, describes the, the trust inference piece, the thing that decides how trustworthy a machine is. And the last part here um, describes the, uh, the access proxy and how we uh, you know, how we figure out who you are and how we figure out who the machine is, how we do global deployment, um, how we delegate down to the access control engine. And the fourth one, which is just coming out, has got to do with um, really organizational issues, how we got buy-in from execs, how we dealt with users, how we handled the migration piece. Okay. That, that'll be, I think, sometime in June. Yeah. So we've been quite open about what, we're, what we've done. We've actually no problem telling people what we've done. It's a bit difficult to give people the code because it's really an internal program. But we tell, we tell people the concepts. Okay. So, so, um, so like I said, we've been doing it for a couple of years. Um, so these are the things that we learned. So those two, uh, that's Larry and Sergey. So a very young picture of Larry and Sergey, to be honest. Um, so the first part was getting executive uh, support. So, um, so I told you we had some quite difficult discussions early on about this particular concept. Um, and I went up to these two, right? And... Uh, uh, in particular, they went, I don't believe you, prove it's true. So we did some type of uh, proof of concept. And eventually they said, this is a great idea. This is going to cost a fortune. But luckily, Google's got loads of money. Um, so you should do this. Right? So we managed to get exact support. And more importantly, we managed to keep it. Right? So like, Google is very, uh, very data-driven company. So we had a, a key metric that we had. And we had lots of leading metrics. And every time we went to some type of exact review, we were able to say, you know, X metric moved by Y percent. We're on our way to doing this, and it's still the right thing to do. Okay, and we would get buy-in from there. So that was all. That was probably the most important um, part. We were also able to use that to be able to tell other parts of the company to do things, like getting the NetOps people to update the kit in every single building, right? And spend, you know, some large number of millions to do it. Yeah. Okay. Second issue is uh, quality, or lesson is quality. So, uh, as I'm sure it's obvious, or maybe obvious, that we're relying on knowledge of uh, device and users. If we end up with bad data, we're sort of screwed, right? So if it turns out that uh, you are, you're, you're, you're uh, in the system as somebody who works in legal, but you're actually not, right? Then you have access to legal apps, but you actually don't have access to the apps that you should have access to. So that's a bit of a, an issue. If we um, had decided that every single machine was um, untrusted, then that would also be sort of not good because we wouldn't let anybody in. So the quality of the data and the review we did of all the processes to be able to make sure the data was good quality was fairly key and a long and arduous uh, process. And this one here. So, um, so the, all the effort we put in, which actually at the time I argued against, I, I said we should be able to break some people. Um, that one, in fact, was a correct decision. Um, so if we had, had, if we had broken loads of people, um, that would have gone up to some other layer of exec support, and their exec support would have disappeared, pretty much. So we put a huge amount of effort into migrating people, and we've done it apart from a very odd minor you know, problem. right? Um, so enabling painless migration is key to doing something like this. Um, this is also good. Even though so it was fairly painless, we would tell people this is what we're doing. So we used to get a escalations into the security team that, oh my god, I can access the, you know, the finance app from outside without a VPN. And they go, this huge security hole, and we go, no, 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 that's actually the way it's meant to work. Um, so there was, uh, there was lots of issues like that. People were, so we had to train people to expect this as a normal way of working. Like when people join the company, they go, this can't be, this can't be real, this is weird. Um, so, we have to, so we did lots of messaging. And then as we moved people from this network to the other network, we told them, you're going to move to the new network. It's going to have no effect whatsoever on you, but we're going to tell you anyway. So there was lots of uh, uh, key messages to um, our users. Okay. 
Um, this is the last one. So this is my team. So I'm a site reliability engineering manager. That's what I do. That's the, the group in Google who keep Google up. Right? Uh, and lots of other orgs is called DevOps. Uh, Google is called SRE. So, um, so my teams, there's two teams in Dublin. There's two teams in LA who are in my group. And they run all those systems. Right? So they run the access proxy. They run the trust engine. They run the various uh, um, systems. And we're actually pretty good at it, thanks be to God. Right? Um, so to the point that we actually wrote a book about it for people who didn't know what SRE is. So again, like if again with my teams, if it turns out that we push a new version of some system and it crashes, then nobody gets access to anything. Or if we push a system that has a bug in it, and suddenly everything is untrusted, then like literally the company stops working, like literally. Right? But I'm glad to say we've never done that. We almost did it once, but uh, it never actually happened. Right? Um, so that's um, highly reliable systems. Okay, and this is just the, the, the summary. So, in terms of Beyond Corp, don't trust your network. If you think you can have a privileged, safe internal network, you really can't. Right? It's only a matter of time before somebody gets in, like the WannaCry thing where they use Samba to move around the network. Um, in case it isn't obvious, that couldn't happen in here, um, because you can't actually move laterally across the network at all in Beyond Corp. Right? So, any of those 70% of, of devices on this unprivileged network, that could not have happened because you can't move. That. The only way you can access things is through the access proxy. Right. Um, instead, rely on knowledge of users and devices and be careful when migrating, otherwise you're gonna use your, lose your exact support. Okay. So, 